always nice to uh, be able to put a, a, a faces to the names. And Martine, I know it was you that applied originally, wasn't it, for uh, the funding? Um, and uh, I think you probably wasted quite a long time because Nottinghamshire was sort of um, out with our area of uh, working, but um, COVID has um, been very kind um, to us uh, in some ways, um, not in others. Uh, once upon a time, of course, I would arrive at, uh, at one of your school assemblies and have an old fashioned check and engage with the children and all that good stuff, which was fine. Um, clearly that's not possible these days, but I think the upside is very definitely been that we can engage with schools and we can meet you this way. Um, and also perhaps, you know, if you uh, if you manage to put together um, a little bit about the school, uh, I think it allows our members, the master et al, to um, uh, learn about exactly what we do with Glasson Society. So um, delighted that you're going to be part of the programme. Um, looking forward to hearing a little bit about your school um, and uh, also uh, exactly what you're going to do with the kit. Yes. So it's really over to you. Well, Carl, you're going to speak first and talk about the school. Yes. Um, so yeah, I was I was um, just going to give a bit of background about the school and where we are with our curriculum, and then how science plays its part um, within that. So um, a few years ago, well, two years ago, we we spent quite a, a significant length of time researching um, different types of curriculum. Uh, we we knew we needed to to redevelop our curriculum. Um, and what we have come up with through a lot of research in terms of what actually works in terms of being most effective for, for teaching and learning, we've come up with a curriculum which allows us to revisit all of our subject content on a regular basis. So for each subject, including science, we've identified subject specific ways of learning so how to be a scientist. So that's the best way to think of it, how to be a scientist. And then each term, we would try and cover as much of the subject content that's part of the national curriculum through that particular way of working. So you, you have a, a sort of a dual pronged approach where your focus for that term, for example, in science might be to... Um, to, to perform fair tests but then what you're doing through performing fair tests you're looking at different actual content different subject knowledge through that so by using that approach we're able to go over each aspect of the curriculum two or three times over a year and the idea is that we want to make a real difference to the children's long-term memory historically and quite um, typically what schools tend to do is say for the autumn term, we're going to cover this part in science plants. And then in the spring term, we're going to cover this part of science. And then in the summer term, we're going to cover the next part of science. And you may spend four or five weeks covering a particular aspect of science. But what we found when carrying out our research and through our own experiences, by the time the children get to the end of the key stage, a couple of years down the line, they forgot what they did two years ago in the autumn term and all they can remember are the things that they've done most recently. So we wanted to come up with a way to allow our children to really hold on and retain all the, the knowledge that they need to be, as well as developing their skills in particular subjects as well. So we want our children to understand what it means to be a scientist whilst retaining that subject knowledge as well. Um, and in addition to that, we've we've sort of we've used a couple of uh, teaching strategies to, to help with that as well. So at the start of every single lesson, science and, and all of the lessons, we do a, what we call a whiz quiz, a little quiz at the start of the lesson. It's 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 basically a PowerPoint which keeps all those plates spinning. And it's very uh, low key. It's all the children um, answering in, in chorus. So there's no sort of picking out individual children or, or no pressure on individuals. But the idea is that we're keeping that subject knowledge 
spinning every single lesson. So they're coming back to it every single week when they're, when they're looking at science. And what we found, although this is only the second year we've started with this approach, children are retaining a lot more information and they're actually remembering what they've learned the year before in much more detail than they were previously. So Martin's going to talk more specifically about how science plays its part within the curriculum and, and what she wants to use the money for and, and the new kit that she wants to purchase for. But I thought it was just helpful to sort of give you an idea that um, we, we run quite a unique and individual curriculum at Woodthorpe, which we're very proud of. And it's not the sort of typical thing you might encounter in, in other schools as well. OK, so over to you, Martine. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to share the screen so you can see the PowerPoint, which um, Martine has prepared. Well, I'm really passionate about science and the children in our school all know um, that I'm absolutely passionate about it so every time they see me they say oh I'd love to be a scientist or they tell me about their experiments and which is really lovely so you know I do a lot of science within the school we run a science club um, we've had the ducklings in recently and um, we have the butterflies and um, I'm part of the Ogden Trust as well so that is um, a trust run by the university so I'm part of the partnership as well so we we run networks across other schools and um, so we recently did a, a winter competition where the children took photographs of the essence of winter and our school won which we were delighted and um, but what I want to do is we have this outside area in the playground which I want to develop to have it as an exploratory area for the children so the kit that I want to purchase is going to be in the playground so we, I want to have um, a unit that the children can go outside when they're doing their science lessons and um, they can go outside and they can use the, the kit there and it's accessible for them because you know children love to learn outside you know and I want to engage them and ignite them with the outdoors so that's my vision my vision is to to have this exploratory area out there Within the classrooms, I do encourage the teachers, they all have an exploratory area in the classroom where they, um, for example, in my classroom, we planted just a, um, a twig off a tree in some sand and we've watered it and that twig has blossomed. So the children have been in awe that they can't believe that this twig has blossomed in the classroom. So that's what I want to do as well. I want to have outside. So what I'm planning on doing is for, for the teachers is having this area set up so that when the teachers are doing their um, learning content on plants and um, habitats that they can go outside all the equipment is there for the children to use and um, you know to enhance this, the science lessons yeah <coughs> So that's what I want to do, develop the area. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to buy some planters. So each um, class in Key Stage 1 have their own planters. So then they, the children have got ownership of growing their own vegetables. They're growing their own um, uh, flowers and plants as well. So, and obviously we want the magnifying glasses so the children can go outside and they can really explore the area. We have also got a forest school within our um, playground and we often take the children down there which is brilliant as well so if they've got the equipment then they can use that um, it's more readily for them to use rather than teachers having to try and get the equipment out it's all there ready for them so as i say science lessons can take place outdoor looking at the living things and their habitats and plants and resources to hand to the children to use so, so obviously the impact at the moment I can't measure because we haven't got the equipment and we need to get the area ready. And unfortunately with COVID as well, it's been, we've, it's been delayed on getting our planters. So, um, so that is where I'm going with this project. I just want to show you this presentation. I've, I've, we've got a little video clip of some of the children um, in the school, what science means to them. 
tell me what science means to you? Science means to me experimenting, getting new kinds of tools, like the coronavirus maybe, finding out new ways to make technology, and studying new um, methods. Uh, like weather stations, you can uh, see plants grow, and in the dark humus, and so you can see through and the Start, I think, to show us where we're beginning. Mm. What are you going to do with it? Apart from putting planters where you've got that piece of land, what else are you going to put in there? Well, what I'd like to do with the planters is obviously we're going to use it a lot for growing, um, and I'm going to run a, a lunchtime club with the children as well, so that we can use the equipment as well at lunchtime. I'd like to also um, have um, an outside clock there as well. So I want to make it so that the children can, you know, look at the time and the humidity as well. And, um, you know, just really have it as a lovely exploratory place. Do, do you engage with the parents very much and encourage them to come in and join in with the science sort of um, activities? Yes, we do. Um, but obviously this year we've not been able to do that because of COVID. Um, but we do have a science day every year, which uh, parents who are scientists come in and they do some workshops with us and they do an assembly. So we have got quite a few networks with the parents as well. So we do encourage the parents to come in. Martin, tell me, how did you, uh, how did you actually hear about the, uh, our organisation? Well, I went on with the Ogden Trust. We went on some training. Oh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, they were talking about the space camp. We had the space camp training, mm -hmm. and um, the lady mentioned it then. So I just thought it was an ideal opportunity to take it up. 
and see how, you know, if we could, um, you know, get a, get a bid in. Absolutely, definitely. Oh, Tony wants to ask. Could I just ask you what the size is of this area? That looks quite small to me on the picture. Is that uh, not an illusion? It's, the, well, the, that area is just going to be kind of a base for the exploratory because in the class, in the playground as well, we've got an, a forest school area, which is far bigger. So the children can use that as the base and then they can use the equipment to explore the forestry area at the bottom of the playground as well. Yeah, because if you're going to have planters for each class, I don't know how many classes you do have or you envisage being in there, but you wouldn't get more than sort of four planters in that little area. That's all we're having is four planters because yeah. we are, we're in infant schools, so we've only got four key stage one classes. So mm. there'll be a planter for each key stage one class. Yeah. And then we've got the foundation unit, so we'll have the planters up in the foundation unit. Yeah. So, yes, the, the, so, we, there will be just four planters there. Yeah. So where do you envisage keeping the equipment? In that same area? Yes, I wanted to get a lock-up unit in that area. It is secure, the playground is secure. Ah. So I wanted a lock-up unit there so that the teachers don't have to go in you know, get the equipment out, the equipment is already there, so it's to hand for the children, which will make... My London it, brain, you see, saying that anything that's not nailed down will walk. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, we have, we have got good security, and we have um, a caretaker who lives on site as well, so we are lucky, mm -hmm. so we've got plenty of security. That sounds good. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Um... Do, do the children have access to a pond or running water? We don't, no, we don't. We have got the the park at beside our school, there is a pond there, you know, like a little uh, stream. But no, they don't actually have access to running water in the we, playground. We are, sorry, Barbara, we are in the process of actually building a pond in our forest school, but it's it's not there yet so in a, a year or so we will have a pond oh but, that's uh, be good yeah yeah we have got um some of the parents have um, got ponds and they're bringing in tadpoles into school for the children as well to observe in the classroom which is really lovely could i ask you to say a little bit about <coughs> the school in general where you draw your parent your, your pupils from and overall size and things and the governors perhaps yeah so during uh, during martin's presentation I, I did think actually i should have gave, given a, a bit more sort of general background to the school so we are an infant school um so that means we take children up to seven years old so up to and including year two so we have three year groups we have reception year one and year two in each year group, we have two classes of 30 children each. So in total, our school number is, is 180. We take children from the Woodthorpe area in Nottingham. Um, so it's quite a, um, a, I don't want to say privileged, but quite a, a white middle class area. We have a very supportive um, network of parents that are involved with the school and um, we are predominantly white British but we also do have um, a, 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 well, a, a percentage of um, Muslim children that come to the school as well. Um, in terms of the school's history it was built in the 50s and we we are the official feeder school for the junior school, which is located next door, which is Arno Vale Junior School as well. So whilst we are two separate schools, we do have naturally close links with them because we are on the same plot of land with a gate and a fence um, separating the two schools. So all of our children do tend to go to the junior school there as well. So they're... Uh, their intake of parents is very much the parents that come to us as well. Are they bigger than you? 
They are, yes, because they have more year groups. So we have three year groups, whereas they would have uh, four year groups. So they have an additional 60 children that uh, go to them as well. And do, do your governors uh, govern both schools or is it just for the infants? You have a separate set for the infant school and do you have difficulty recruiting them? We, we have separate governors. Um, we, we usually have quite a lot of interest from a parental governor um, viewpoint and also we have lots of ex or retired teachers um, who are on our governing body. Where we find it more difficult to recruit governors are those from a non-educational background. Um, so currently we're, we're sort of doing a bit of a recruitment drive for our governors to try and get um, a different skill set into the school, particularly more finance based um, people to work on the governing body. Um, but because of the area that uh, we are in, we do we do seem to have a sort of uh, a, a, an unusually high amount of um, teachers and and people in education that live in the area. So they're the ones who naturally are are, are people that want to get involved with the school in a, in a governing capacity. Interesting. And how how are you funded? So we're funded from the from the uh, local authority. We are a uh, yeah, we're a, a state maintained school. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thanks. Heath. And, uh, and, and have you had things like Ofsted inspections and sort of been rated as to your successes? Yeah. So our last Ofsted was in two thousand and fourteen. And to be honest, Ofsteds are a bit like MOTs. They're only really valid for the day that they happen. Yeah. Um, so when, whenever we have new parents, we, we're always very upfront and, and we say to them not really to take much notice of an Ofsted report from seven, eight years ago, because it's not relevant anymore. We've had three different cohorts of children come through the school in that time. And most of our staff are different to those that um, underwent that previous Ofsted. So whilst we are officially an outstanding school, for me personally and for my staff, our um, judgment comes from the children and the parents. And, and if they're happy and parents are happy and, and results are always above national average at the school, then we must be doing something right. Absolutely right. Absolutely. Mm. That's good. Um, I, I don't know whether you know is that we're imminently waiting at the moment. Um, Tomorrow is supposed to be a vote by the United Nations. Um, as to whether they are going to declare next year as the International Year of Glass, which um, is going to be quite um, an event. Um, many of the glass institutions and organisations that we are associated with are already talking about raising the profile and the importance of glass. Um, and in particular, um, we are involved or associated with a big project that's going on, taking place north of you up in St. Helens. Um, yeah. There's a huge research centre that's going to be built um, to pioneer the development and manufacture of glass, reducing its carbon footprint. Um, and there's already been some great strides made in that this year um, already. NSERC, who's one of the partners of that, um, just recently produced a whole batch of glass bottles that had no carbon footprint at all. Mm -hmm. um, so there's great things happening with glass and the glass artists movement as well is also looking forward to being able to um, promote glass overall as an industry and also as an art form. So you could well get involved in that because yeah. there'll be some yeah. competitions and things going on. And I must admit, we've done quite uh, we've done a few things recently to reduce our carbon footprint and to, to be a more sort of carbon neutral place. Um, so, for example, you may know from your children and things having the cartons of milk at school. So we've actually done away with cartons of milk and have moved to uh, cups. Um, so actually, we, we now receive like you would at a shop, four pints, six pints of milk and and we, we pour the milk for the children rather than having um cartons and straws which inevitably end up in the bin 
Um, we've ensured we've got recycling bins in every room in the school. And also we use our um, waste from snacks uh, for our compost heap as well. So we are doing what we can to, um, to, yeah, to be mindful of that as well. Very good, very good. Excellent. Is it... mm. Aubrey, we're on mute. Do you share your equipment with the junior school or do you think it would, or do they already have sufficient? Um, we don't typically share um, sort of curriculum equipment with them. We do sometimes share the sites with each other, depending on what the schools need um, access to. But um, because they are funded as a separate entity to us, they have their own budget and, and their own set of resources, which they, they use. Thank you. From a science perspective, perceptive sorry from a science perspective um how diverse do you think glass is where which areas do you think we we as glass sellers would represent i mean the obvious one is sort of you know bottles and drinks um and things like that but do you know where else glass is actually featured uh, typically, it comes under the um, properties of materials, yeah, everyday materials, everyday materials, and, and looking at use of materials and, and use and, and benefits and advantages and disadvantages of different types of materials. So, which forms quite a big aspect of the science curriculum. Yeah. Um, so it is it is used quite regularly. Yes, in, in um, year one and year two. And, and going back to our sort of curriculum approach, each term when we are looking at science, um, each aspect of the curriculum, each um, of the subject um, knowledge of science is actually covered in each half term. So it is a recurring theme right through the year, rather than the sort of, I suppose, traditional way of teaching, which would be it might be blocked into the autumn term and then never never revisited again whereas we we do cover each aspect of of the curriculum throughout the year and well in our whiz quizzes as well there will be um it is about the properties of materials everyday materials so the children will talk about glass whether it is transparent translucent opaque so we'll you know we'll be using that key vocabulary as well it was quite interesting because one of the Glass and Society projects that took place a few years ago um, was instigated with recognising that there was a, um, a huge unemployment problem in the Isle of Wight. Um, and one of our past masters instigated an inter-school competition um, using fibreglass. Um, and the objective was to stimulate an interest in fiberglass and fiberglass industry because, of course, the Isle of Wight is quite famous for making boats, um, which is huge, partly made from fiberglass. So the inter-school competition, and in fact, we were in, normally we would do a project for a year, but this one we were involved in for several years till we handed it over to the local, th local authority. Um, and this was a stimulation to encourage, as I say, the children to have an interest in construction of that nature um, and they created all sorts of things out of fiberglass which was quite amusing we had another project where the children wanted to do their um, coat of arms with stained glass um, which we, we um, assisted with glass artists um, to, to actually do that they did the design themselves um, and did a huge collage which was subsequently made so the diversity of, of all the things that can be done um, is quite enormous. That's, yeah, that's quite interesting to hear actually, Paul, in terms of how other schools are using that. Because one thing, the sort of the next step, I suppose, in our curriculum development is looking at more ways of actually getting people into school and more real life yeah. experiences for the children in school. So that's actually something which we can yeah. we can talk about um, so for example in art we're looking at getting actual artists into school to carry out workshops with the children so well, knowing yeah. that things like that are happening and, and can be available we, we we have 
historically engaged with um, glass artists that we are aware of um, and they've interacted with the schools whereas the children have actually done the design or have come up with the concept and then the artist is commissioned to actually do the work and work with the children and doing it. In fact Barbara when she had her factory in Stourbridge they had children actually going to see how glass was blown and the expressions on their faces was absolutely extraordinary because they had no concept of, of what you could do with a big blob of hot molten glass. Um, and the, um, the White Cone Museum, which is um, being pioneered now in uh, Stourbridge, um, is actually going to be doing things like that and opening up the possibilities of what can be done. So we, we're quite happy to work. I mean, we, we, we had a school just outside Birmingham about three or four weeks ago. Um, they're passionate about glass. And we've already put them in touch with um, uh, a little glass shop about uh, ten, not more than 10 miles away from them to engage with them with the possibility of doing their coat of arms with glass and, and working with the children. Because a lot of glass artists are very, very keen to encourage young people um, to, to uh, work with glass. It's such a fascinating subject. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, you're saying about the glass blowing. I remember being 11 years old on a school trip to the Isle of Wight, watching glass blowing for the first time. Uh -huh. And it, yeah, it's still a vivid memory now. I can remember it now. <laughs> it's uh, we, We've got several... Um, the, the pluses, I mean, we many people dwell on the negatives of COVID, but the pluses for us has, have, have been a huge learning curve. And in fact, we have... Um, collected now over 65 videos which are on our YouTube channel and several of them are of our glass artists that we've been involved with and they show the work that they do and how they do it um, and it's absolutely riveting to watch some of it um, the, the, the intricacies of, of how they work and what they do um, and I would encourage you to have a little explory uh, exploratory. If you get bored with television, which most of us do these days, have a look at our YouTube channel and you'll find a mountains of information uh, and entertainment of all sorts to do with glass, as well as the presentations from the other schools. Yeah, well, we did watch a couple of the yeah, presentations, did. didn't we? Yeah. yeah, it's quite fascinating, actually, how all the different schools um, are coping with the COVID and also how they're dealing with um, integrating with science uh, and, and doing their science projects. It's very, very um, encouraging that they're doing such a thing. It's great. Martin, will... Do you have a particular time scale that you think, I mean, obviously everything's down to COVID as we know, but um, any ideas when you might actually get the, uh, your, your vision uh, will become a reality? Well, I'm hoping to hopefully get it done before the end of term. Oh, great. That's what I'm hoping. If not, it will be September, definitely. At okay. the beginning of September, it will be. The yeah, idea, we want it up and running for, for September. For September, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's understandable. Well, the, the other thing, uh, before I forget, I'm sorry, everybody, um, but um, our, our forms are amended now, but um, I need your banking information. Um, uh, we, we're, we're high tech these days. We don't have <laughs> some old fashioned bits of paper that are completely useless. Um, and take it forever and then get lost. Um, uh, so uh, if you'd be good enough, Martine, to give me that information, I shall be able to send you some money. Lovely, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have you have you got your planters organised? Are you going to have um, boxes or wooden truckles or what? Yes, we've been we've just actually been looking at those this afternoon. We did have somebody who was going to make them for us, but unfortunately that's fallen through. So we're going to we were looking at buying some. We have got, as you could see, the sleepers there. So that is going to be a big job for me to move the sleepers that's and nice. move the earth to get the planters. So it will be an a, you know a little task to do, but. And um, we are going to buy some uh, planters, you know, that are already made and we want the plastic in them as well so that it will keep the, you know, they won't rot the wood. So they hopefully will last quite a long time. So we're on the, we're on the, 
at the moment, Ms. me and Mr. Hopkinson were looking at those earlier today to see which if we can get some, which we will do. Excellent, excellent. That sounds very promising. I suppose quick growing things, if you're going to try and do something before the end of term, sort of sort of vegetables yeah. on the sort of radish and beetroot front, I would have thought. Yes, yes, <laughs> we, it's all in hand. In. <laughs> we're doing some growing in the classroom as well. We've got some sunflower seeds that we're planting with the children as well. So, ah, great. Yeah. Hmm. Good, good, good. Well, I think we'll hand over to the master, I think, to right. sum it all up. Yeah. Yeah, can I just ask, can you remind us of your glass seller's shopping list? I, I haven't seen it, unfortunately. Yes, I have got it here. So I have got, I've asked for some children's binoculars, that quite robust binoculars, um, some magnifying um, glasses, um, microscopes, um, some weather stations, which are lovely. I don't know if you can see that. You probably can't see the picture. Mm. They're like a dome, a glass dome, mm. where the children plant, and then they can observe the plants growing. Yeah. So they're really nice. And a weather vane I put down as well, which has got a rain gauge on it, a glass rain mm. gauge, so that they can um, check the, the rainfall. And then a, a, a large cupboard as well just yes. so that I can have it locked and uh, it's all accessible and everything's there ready for the children and the, the staff to use. Oh, excellent. Yeah. That's all very well thought out. Well, congratulations to both of you, Keith and Martine, uh, and thank you for taking the time to tell us all about it. Uh, immensely impressive in and innovative um, curriculum ideas and such obviously huge enthusiasm for imparting scientific understanding to the children, which is wonderful to see. Um, they'll all be firing off to Mars before we know where we are. <laughs> That's the plan. <laughs> uh, which we look forward to. And, and such, um, alert and lively children too um you're very you're very lucky you've obviously got a good you're very lucky yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. no it, it was most impressive and wonderful to see it all um make the best use of what we're going to give you and uh let us know how you get on with it and uh there's always the option to come back for more. I'm not promising that the charity will give it to you, but it's worth a try. Thank you. And um, so best wishes to you all. Good luck with the school and its scientific progress. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Really nice engagement with you all. Yes. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So we'll wish you a very good afternoon and hopefully we'll be in touch some more very soon. Okay, thank you. Bye. I'll email you, Lee. I'll be okay. in touch. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye.